Welcome to History and Lowell. I'm Marissa Groom. I'm here with my personal professor, Bob Foran, and we have a very special guest, the founder and executive director, and also my friend, Krista Brown. <laughs> Welcome. Yes, Krista, the founder and executive director of the Free Soil Arts Collective. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, Krista, you've been doing some really impressive work, I think, just since the Free Soil Arts Collective started. Um, before we get into a really cool project that you're working on right now, why don't you tell us more about Free Soil and what you've been up to, what you've done, because it's, I think not just is it fitting just in Lowell to have this, like, entrepreneurial spirit that you have as a woman and a business owner but like also it's black history month and you are out here making history and i think that it's important to honor the black women who are creating legacies as we are alive and you're doing that so yeah let's, let's hear about free soil and what free soil was born out of and yeah tell us about it a little a little over a week ago so free soil we're actually at the two-year mark we were founded late january 2019 and um, our mission is to amplify and strengthen the voices of artists of color. Um, the idea for Free Soil did come out of a, out of frustration, out of a lack of representation in the arts community here in the Merrimack Valley. Um, I'm from Haverhill, Massachusetts originally, and I came back to this area to live in 2012. And I'm a theater person. I found acting at age 12. I have a BFA in theater. Um, so when I came back here to live, I quickly found that all the opportunities to act and perform were outside of my community. So I was constantly going to Boston, which um, over time, you know, I didn't have a car, I'm taking the train and then I'm commuting and I'm making all these connections in a community that's not mine. And after a couple years of that, I was like, there has to be something we can do here. There have to be other artists like me who are also frustrated with the lack of opportunity. So I just took a leap. Um, I reached out to the Greater Lowell Community Foundation about what we were trying to do. And I wanted us to be recognized as like a real organization. So they became our fiscal sponsor two years ago. And um, since then we've been doing original plays, Hair Tales, Stories of Black Heritage, which you were in with um, another wonderful group of women. Um, we've been doing youth programming where um, we really empower young folks to find their voice through storytelling and telling their own stories. Um, we also had a partnership with UMass Lowell where their string project collaborated with our young people. So as they're writing a story, you have these college students that are developing an original score to go with their story. And we did that virtually this year and to see the end result is just amazing. So, um, and we've had tons of events going on that are highlighting um, artists all the time. We have the Vita Voices series that's presented by Enterprise Bank. We have a residency with Merrimack Repertory Theater. So um, at the core of it all, we're just trying to center voices of color and brainstorming all the opportunities that we can make here um, for people like look like me, but also other folks of color. So it's been a wild ride. <laughs> Yes, that's so incredible. Have, oh, go ahead, Bob. Yep. I have a histo I have a historian's question. Oh, I know. Why the name? Yes. Why the name? Yeah. Um, you knew I was going to ask you this. I knew. <laughs> uh, so when we were first um, like shooting names around, I wanted something that was relevant to the Merrimack Valley somehow. So I was doing some digging and um, found the story of Nathaniel Booth, who is a um, a formerly enslaved person who came to Lowell and I believe other places seeking freedom and the Free Soil Party advocated for his life and for his safety. And their motto was something um, like free soil, free labor, free men. And, you know, if those who work the soil deserve to be free. So our belief is that those who come from these stories or identities that are often under amplified, they have the right to tell their own stories. So everything we do is very much, what do you want to do? What do you want to see? Not us telling people what they should want to talk about. Um, yeah, so that's our tie to to the land. Yeah, I remember when I first saw the name, I emailed you and said, oh, okay. Yeah. This is the name? <laughs> very good. So the historian in me was... Yes. Some folks will email me just that. They'll do like a blurb of history for me and be like, is this what you're about? So it's been cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there's that, and I think it's great to explain it because I don't necessarily think automatically people would get this historical connection between pre-Civil War and what's happening in 2021. That's where we are, right? 2021. Uh, and so I think, <laughs> and I, I mean, I love the name because I love that way of thinking, taking the long view of the history of the story, which obviously is what we do here. Yeah. with history and law and so it really it's like it's very cool i just want you to let viewers know yeah it wasn't a trick question i'm sure you <laughs> figured i was going to ask you sooner or later <laughs> i'd love to talk about it <laughs> well yeah. i think the goal here of what we're trying to do and you know with history and lol is really to tell those unheard stories right or to tell the stories that we don't always learn in school and i think that we have kind of a shared goal right um our first episode of History and Lowell was about Black History and Lowell. And you're working on a project that directly relates to that. So yeah. do you wanna tell us more about that? Yeah, um, so the project is called Visualizing Lowell's Black Hist Visualize Lowell's Black History. Um, and it actually came out of a grant that DIY Lowell applied for through Mass Development, through their Common Places grant, Commonwealth Places grant. <laughs> and um, the whole idea is we have an opportunity to leverage these undertold stories, these black stories as a way to kind of encourage folks to explore downtown during COVID. So um, we have a magical committee of folks who are helping me, Mertz is part of them. Um, and we are really looking at history that has been provided through um, Martha Mayo from the Center for Lowell History, Allison Horrocks from the Lash Lowell National Historical Park Service. And we are kind of, um, shaping the narrative with all of this information at our disposal. So we're looking to have by the end of June of this year, they're gonna be um, history trail signs throughout downtown, giving people stories of black people who lived in Lowell. Um, we're gonna have QR codes for stories that are a bit more in depth that'll go to a website at visitdtl.com with more information. And um, we also have some public art pieces that we're gonna be working on. So you're gonna see a socially distanced play depending on what the summer looks like in America. Um, and <laughs> we're also gonna have vinyl banners put up. We're gonna have an art walk that speaks to the black experience as well and a sculpture. So Free Soil will be putting out a call for artists fairly soon to just promote that work and see um, what artists of color we can work with to bring this story to life. Um, I will pre preface it by saying a lot of this work is temporary, if that makes sense. So like the signs that we have are gonna be um, up until they, the elements, whatever happens, but there is a push from both the DIY team and the committee to just explore ways we can make these things permanent. Um, Cause we have permanent signage throughout Lowell depicting um, white history. So I think there's opportunity to think about how can we make these stories not undertold and not underheard and how does this become more of a permanent thing? Um, and I also believe Martha Mayo is working on this as well, specifically when it comes to the Underground Railroad and all these stories we hear of different sites being spots. It's like, how do we recognize that locally, but even nationally, like making Lowell a place that people can go to, to learn about black history. Cause I know people like me, I would go anywhere to just experience the history of my people. So I think Lowell has a really cool opportunity to say, um, our history is not pretty and it is tied up in all of these things and come to Lowell, experience it, educate yourself and tell others to come. So I think this work is really important. These are things that Bob and I have been talking about for as long as we've been connected. Um, when I'm learning from Bob, all of the history that Lowell has to offer and all the ways that Black folks contributed to that history way, like, way before our time. And I'm sitting here like, well, how come I didn't know? Yeah. And, 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 and Bob has said these same things, you know, there should be signs here. There should be signs that say, you know, this was an underground railroad stop or Frederick Douglass spoke here and, and, and all of the hotbed of uh, anti-slavery efforts that were going on. So um, it's, a, it's an incredibly important project, I think, that you're, you're bringing to life. And um, it's something that is well overdue and we definitely need to, push, we need to push for things to be permanent. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I love the idea of the permanent 
signs, but it's always a, it's been my experience that in Lowell, it's a struggle. I've heard you have that. so many different entities. You have the historic, nothing bad per se when I'm saying this, but you have the historic board that wants to weigh in. You have the park that wants to weigh in. Sometimes you have the cultural council that wants to, everybody has their hands in the pie yeah. to try to say the sign can only be this big and it can only be this color and it can only, and so I've become a fan of, um, for lack of a better term, guerrilla signage. It hey. just goes up until somebody decides to take it down um, <laughs> because, um, and it's just part of a way to get the story out. I have friends in New York City that have been working for a long time to try to get monument or memorial to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, to the victims of the fire, 146 mostly young immigrant women workers lost their life in this factory fire. And it's taken forever because NYU now owns the building mm. and they're very fussy about what is gonna be put on the building. And so what they've started doing is using chalk and going to the street addresses where people lived and chalking their names in the sidewalk. Mm. And when the weather changes and it goes away, it goes away. But the idea is this person lived there, right? I mean, and it really, I mean, I think it fits because I know in a lot of the more recent um, civil rights protests, organizing Black Lives Matter, what have you, people are, it's important people always keep saying, say her name or say his name, like remembering people. And so even like, chalking Nathaniel Booth on the side of a building. So people walk by, oh, I wonder who that guy is. Mm, mm. Gets and people it, thinking, right? Yeah. And I also think it just gives, personally, it, it just gives me more of a stake here. Like learning all the stories and understanding like, wow, like this building used to be owned by a black person who was enslaved, who raised a family, who was buried in Lowell Cemetery. Like this ground here beneath it was an underground railroad or to know like Frederick Douglass spoke there, Martin Luther King spoke there. Like it gives you pride. And I feel like the first couple of mm -hmm. years I was here, I wasn't, I didn't feel that. I felt the mills poured. I felt um, even like the strong rallying around immigration poured. And I did not get that same rallying around black history it was kind of done like me and maritza talking about it on the side or like hitting up friends or um i went on a walk i think that richard howe did and that's the first time i heard about saint anne's church that was the very first time and that was after living here for a few years um so i think it's just not something we need to shy shy away from like there's such power in acknowledgement like i even feel as with um what we're going through now as a country where racism has, has been here, of course, but I think now people like myself, even though it wouldn't really solve anything, I'm just yearning for acknowledgement, like say what happened, just communicate that. And then it becomes a part of our narrative now. We can't just act like it, we can't act like it didn't happen. We can't act like these textiles were magically made out of this material that floated up from the South. Like we just can't, we can't do that anymore. And we owe the people, I could talk y'all, but like even through the research with this project and thanks to you too, because um, Bob Maritza, you helped with this research, finding that like there are slaves in Mississippi quoted saying like, I got my Lowell, cla I got my Lowell cloth from the Massa today. Like, Lowell cloth was a thing, you know, like. Yep. Yeah, plantations were the were, were one of the largest customers. Yeah, for what was produced in in all of the economy of Massachusetts and we the state shies away from the history because we want to we want to see ourselves as like the northern white liberal mm -hmm. whatever right we don't recognize day to day what's happening around in communities of color in the Commonwealth to begin with, nor do we want to actually recognize that most of the fortunes made in Massachusetts in the early days of it, when it was a colony of Britain through the 19th century were made from the trade in enslaved people. Yeah. And so we, we and it's just like, it, we can't bring ourselves as a Commonwealth to admit it, Yeah. right? And so it really is, um, and Lowell has the same trouble 
right? Because to acknowledge where the cotton came from is to have to have a fairly deep conversation. The conversation should be happening at Lowell High and at Middlesex Community College, at UMass Lowell, wherever, right? But it's not happening. So with what you're doing, like, is there a particular person or two that like you've bumped into in doing this that it was like, whoa, this is a really interesting story that I had never heard of before. Are, are there people that you, you sort of sat back in your chair and said, huh, Ooh. how come I didn't know about this person? Yes, so I may forget names. Um, the first black woman to run for city council. Um, Birdie. Local, yes. Birdie, Birdie Marbury, right? Yeah. Yes, so had no, I mean, figured there would have been a first, but to know how many times she ran, to know um, the trauma she experienced because she ran, like at first it was like, Bertie Malbury, the first woman to run for city council. And you're like, oh, great, heart warm, duh. Then you do the research and you're like, it's not that easy. So that was something that was like, wow, what did she go through? Um, learning about the Lou family, learning that there was, we believe there was signage, permanent signage honoring the Lou family that is not up anymore. I don't wanna misquote anything, but we've been finding some bits of history that were like, oh yeah, there used to be a sign there. It's not up now, what do we do? Like, which to me is a beautiful and challenging conversations to have, I guess, because we're figuring out some stuff that was established that is no longer. Um, I would even argue the integration of the high school. I've told so many of my friends like, mm, Lowell High, one of the first high schools, I think in the country, might be wrong, to be integrated. Then you do the research and you find out a lawsuit prompted that integration. And you find out that it was not just a black student, but also other students of color. And it just, we're finding so much depth to what I would call like the sound bites. Like it's so easy to say like, mm -hmm. mm, integration, mm, but lawsuit, lawsuit implies this was not a welcome thing. It implies people had to fight like, um, and that has been, that's, I think that's really been the most um, surprising thing for me. Uh, knowing where Fuse is now, how that used to be this depot that was also used for like speakers like Frederick Douglass to come and talk to people and how the outside of Fuse, I believe was like a direct replica replication of the depot because the depot had burned down. Mm. I'm just like, ooh, and you think about, ooh, and you think about St. Anne's Church and you think about um, other spots on the Underground Railroad. And I just think about all the black people that were here and it was great. This is another thing I will say, cause I, I'm learning as well. And when we were going through this history, we realized that there's a lot of information on um, white people who housed enslaved people who, you know, stuck their neck out to help put their lives on the line, excuse me, were staunch advocates for black people. I mean, heck, even the Free Soul Party, like it's great. But this story is not is not about that. We are really working to highlight the black people. So St. Anne's Church being a stop on the Underground Railroad, yes. But saying something like the minister was the first person to invite Africans to church. We were like, that's not a story. That's not the kind of, that's not what we're trying to amplify here. We're trying to amplify the black lives, what they did, what they experienced. Um, and the ally portion of Lowell, I do think is very important to mention. I do think it does feed into the, the pride and I, the acceptance that may have been experienced at the time. But this project has had a lot of revisions, a lot of research, um, very time consuming. I've spoken to you both. It's way more work than anticipated. And I mean that in the most beautiful way. It's not clear cut, like Lowell High was integrated, period. It goes, so every single story, every single sound bite, we are literally like looking at resources and like fact checking and thinking about like, who can we talk to in real time that's connected? Like, we gotta talk to Bob, we gotta talk to Maritza, we gotta email Martha, we gotta email Allison. And it's it takes, um time um but hey 
And I will also credit DIY Lowell because this grant was originally supposed to just spur economic activity during COVID. Like that was the goal. And they went out and said, how do we build off some of the work we've done in the past and make it so that black history can be something that spurs economic activity, which is like creative for one, but needed. And um, I also say we, Free Soil has another project coming in the works that I will talk about at another time, but highlighting these voices and highlighting this, these stories, it's something that we have to do. Um, Free Soil came out of a time where I literally was waiting for somebody to do this work. I was like, somebody somewhere is gonna say, hmm, the arts community here doesn't quite reflect the richness of the community. Like I was like, somebody's gonna just pick up on that. And it wasn't happening. I'm like, girl, it's you. So I feel the same way with this. It's the gorilla stuff. We have to do this work because it's not happening. Um, and it's okay. I think it's why we're here. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I, like just to echo some of what you said too, I remember just first learning about Lowell's history and obviously we're inundated with the mill girls, you know, we know about the Greek triangle, we know, you know, about um, the, what is it, St. Saint, Saint John's? Is it St. John's or St. Joseph's Hospital? That was like the French Canadian Saint Hospital. St. Joseph's. Saint Joseph's. Saint like Joseph's. We, yeah, so we know, you know, we, we see the vestiges of these groups and it's so important to tell these stories and it's so important to understand how immigrant history is related to Lowell's history. Yeah. And we, oh, we never get to see these stories about about black folks and, and and like I said until until Bob like I didn't know a lot of things and and like you said they're not just these one liners you have to dig deep yeah. and you have to understand why I actually uh, a couple of days ago I got to sit in on a conversation uh, with Angela Davis um, that was uh, brought to you by the Lawrence Public Library and it was incredible and she talked about why the word radical is so important when we're looking mm -hmm. for radical change because you start at the root and mm -hmm. if you don't address the root of these issues if you're if you're asking these questions why isn't there representation why aren't these stories being told and then you start digging like you're doing right now and you understand there's some of it is intentional right and and some of it has just been swept under the rug because we've been highlighting stories of, of, of white folks in the black plight, right? <laughs> we're not highlighting the black lives that were, that were being lived here and carried out here that were, like you said, they were, they were family members, they were business owners. And yeah. yes, like abolition was a huge part of their lives, but they also had a whole stake in, in the community here. They were, they were, they were contributing to yeah. the Lowell community and those stories do need to be told. And it's incredible that I, I, I just, I'm, I'm a big fan, obviously, um, I'm not biased in any way of the work that Free Soil does, but I think this, this project to me, when like, when you first said that this is what you were gonna do, it sparked something in me that was just like, man, I was, like you said, well, it's like that question, like, okay, well, this needs to be done. This needs to be done. Who's gonna do it? And then you were like, hey, we're doing this. Do you want to get in on? Yeah, of course. Of yeah. course I will. Yes, it needs to be done. And I'm so glad that you were the person that said, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. Um, I will take this on. And I will, I will, I will call up the people who need. <laughs> yeah, I will say, I, I very much was like, we are an arts organization. We are empowering artists of color. But what I'm finding is that art creativity can be a way to do this, like this, I don't know what the term is, just this this sort of work fits under our mission. Originally, I was like, is this off? Does this, but like, we are gonna be using art and signage and performance and to tell these stories. When you and I talked, that was the first time I heard about Birdie Marbury. And then I went and looked for more stuff. And I found out that the first time she ran for council, the night before the primary, her, her office was torched. Yeah. And it was a little story in the paper and the next day it was gone. It was like, yeah. boom, gone. Um, and I thought, whoa, like I get sort of the same, it's like, huh. Yeah. Never heard of her before. I think you gave me the name. Mm -hmm. um, and I went after that, I said, okay, now I got to go look. Mm -hmm. um, and started all these organizations and 
migrated here from Florida. Mm. A really interesting person who people should know more about. Worked at CTI um, and then just disappears. Yeah. 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 And yeah, I'm just thinking about things and we don't. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And um, through this, pro I mean, I also, I would not have known so many of these stories otherwise. If I didn't know you both, um, I would have never like, I don't know. I would have never reached out wanting to know these stories. I, I think this project in a beautiful way kind of forced me to learn. Because like you said, there are, there's the work that you all are doing. I know the park has put on some events, but I don't feel like black history is in my face so much that I can feel adequately informed. So having a grant, having specific outcomes that have to come out of that grant, having these magical community members who are saying like, that's the story we need to tell. No, not that one, that one. Yeah, can we find more information on that? Great, we don't wanna talk about that, great. Like it really is this team effort of people um, who are black, who are saying like, I'm happy you have that story, Krista, but that's not, no, why are we, no. And I'd be like, okay, like it's a team. Um, yeah, and it's just that's overwhelming y'all, it's overwhelming. It it's a lot. And I think that's the other really important, like written and special thing about this project is that you have community buy-in from the black folks who live here, from black folks. Some of us, you know, have been like in and out of Lowell. Some of us have been born and raised in Lowell. And you have that, that like it's black folks who are green lighting this, who are saying, these are the stories that we want told about our community and our history here. And that's just, if that's not empowering, then what is, you know? <laughs> shout them out if there's time y'all <laughs> well we've got two minutes <laughs> if you want to shout okay. out the folks, i'm gonna do go quick La lavinia farusa mona tyree maritza veronica holmes thaddeus miles maria mcduffie jennifer balala curtis amp sam steve koya and kira morehouse mm. yes look at that all under 30 seconds <laughs> incredible folks and I think I'll also like, I wanted to say something about um, the arts and the importance of art and storytelling mm -hmm. um, because art can be a gateway drug into history for people, you know? <laughs> like I think about, you know, um, it, like you're reading historical fiction. I, um, the Water Dancer, right, is a really great story. Mm -hmm. And like Harriet Tubman is a figure in the story. She's not the main character, but then mm -hmm. you learn later um, you know, they're, they're using it, using her, some of the disabilities that she had almost as magical realism in mm -hmm. the book. Like, I didn't know that Harriet Tubman had narcolepsy and that mm -hmm. she would pass out while she was helping people to escape from sleep. I had no idea about that. Mm -hmm. But you, when you look at this, this art that was created, right. Mm -hmm. And then you start doing a little bit more research and you're like, whoa, I would not have even thought to ask these questions mm -hmm. if I didn't read this story. And so if you don't see it, you're not going to think about it. Like you said, if you don't have it right in front of you, it's hard to think about it. And so I think art is integral into, and especially in Lowell. Um, but I think it's safe to say Black history is American history. Uh, thank you so much, Krista, for coming on. Thank you for all the work that you're doing with Free Soil and this project and just in our community. You are incredible. Thank you, Bob. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been History in Lowell.